All right, guys, welcome back to the Adam Peeler Fitness Podcast. Today on the episode, I have Steve DeNovi, who is uh, the founder of PRS Performance. Um, and basically, he is a super, super smart dude with, with coaching. He currently coaches uh, Sean Noriega. He's been coached under Brad Pouliard, um, Hani from uh, the, the Strength Athletes. Um, and he has, a, you know, he's, he has also a USAPL meet diary director if i'm not mistaken and right. puts on the u.s uh like the midwest prime time is very 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 active in the powerlifting community so uh, it's a really big treat to have steve uh steve on to today so yeah thank you for having me on i was telling you before we started i i i love getting to talk about coaching on a podcast so sometimes i'm on podcasts for other reasons to talk about politics or other things within powerlifting, but my true passion is coaching. So I'm, I'm super happy about some of the questions we've got lined up because I just get to nerd out with you. Yeah. So, so first off, uh, how did you, how did you um, end up with, with coaching? Because you were on um, coaching. And so if I'm not mistaken, you did start off with your degree in uh, marketing, correct? Yeah. I've actually got my MBA with an emphasis in marketing and a minor in behavioral psychology. I did not I mean, I went into college, never had worked out a day in my life, um, got obsessive with while I was in college and just started working out. And I graduated um, during kind of the, re the job recession back in like 2010 when no one was getting jobs. I mean, unless you were going to take some just basic sales job, people who were Sounds graduating like with right business now. degrees, <laughs> no one was getting jobs. So I refused to just go into some like entry level sales job. And yeah, I just started personal training. Um, that led to me uh, getting into gym management. So I, I helped to, in different capacities, managing Gold's Gyms throughout the St. Louis area. And then when I got married um, about five years ago, um, we moved for my wife's job. And so in fitness, when you move and you're not online, you get to start over. And so I kind of, I was already coaching some power lifters. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I was just like, let's just go for it. Um, I, I, have, I have the very fortunate ability that um, my wife is able to financially support us. So it didn't really matter if that didn't work out. Fortunately, it did work out. Um, it was a slow process. And I know we'll kind of talk about getting into coaching and kind of what that takes a little bit later on. But like, yeah, I just, I mean, I just loved it. There, there, it wasn't about money for me. It wasn't about anything. It was just like, what, what's the one thing I'd want to do in the world if I could? Um, and I can't be a pro football player because I'm skinny and I'm slow and I'm not super athletic, nor am I very strong in powerlifting either. So I wasn't going to be a great powerlifter, even though I loved powerlifting. So what I felt like I was good at was the coaching side. So yeah, about five years ago or so, I just went full time and dived into that, and, and have grown it since. Yeah, um, that's that's a, a pretty cool little origin story. Um, I think something that I've read and I've have been talking with a lot of people who have been doing uh, personal training, and especially with, with with online. I think a lot of people, um, if you like, if you want to do it as a part time thing something on the on the side you know that that's pretty easy but becoming a full-time powerlifting coach specifically um definitely does take some time and some network working so i guess um one of the questions that I, I had for you was uh, i guess the overall experience of becoming established online um what were the particular steps that you did take to grow your online presence so when it came to the online aspect, I mean, this kind of goes back to that. I had a little bit of a marketing background. And, and one of the things that I understood is like, I'm not strong. Um, no one knows who I am. I don't coach anyone that's cool. So I have to do something different. Like, I, I just can't, like, I can't rely on these other things that some people rely on that be able to kind of get them a head start within the coaching business. So um, there, there's probably three main things that I kind of was like, okay, um, I, I have to be able to establish this to gain some momentum. And a lot of it was perception it is, is based on perception is perception that one, you coach people because if no one knows you coach anyone, then why would anyone reach out to you? Two, perception that these athletes get results. And then three, in my area and niche, I decided, okay, I'm not going to be the strongest. I'm not going to be the coolest. I'm not going to be the most popular. I'm not going to coach so-and-so athlete. I just got to kind of be smarter than everyone. That's kind of like the, the selling point I have that I can stand out. So I need to create this perception of this value I offer that's different that other people can't offer. So um, now within that, perception helps to kind of build that brand and, and get attention. 
but then what actually keeps it is the results and the actual service. So you can start getting people. And then we see that all the time. We see people start getting traction, but we see them kind of fall off. Well, they, they created this perception that they had athletes, they got results and they had this, this unique selling point in this niche. Um, but then they couldn't get anyone results. So it kind of goes back and forth. So to get established, you, you need to be able to kind of build that process and, and not try to be the jack of all trades, like decide what you want to target. And I mean, I, I kind of had, I, I, I'd made this out at one point. I can't say it exactly, but I was trying to target people who had, or obviously one powerlifters, but within powerlifting had an above average knowledge of the sport. Um, I wasn't really targeting beginners. I was targeting people who probably been in the sport a while, very likely had an exercise science degree or some higher education in general, because they generally just wanted to strive for knowledge and they appreciated intelligence and knowledge. Um, and they were probably around a 25 to 35 year old male. And nothing against women, I coach women. It's just that like I had the appeal and kind of the demographic I was going towards was that. And if I, if I get outside of that demographic, awesome. You're, you're, as you get more and more popular, you're gonna, you're gonna start to deviate from that just from the attention. But like, that was the niche I was going for. And the fact is that niche is pretty big in powerlifting. That's kind of powerlifting in a nutshell, 25 to 34 year old men. Um, and there is kind of a split. Like half of the people in that niche are fairly intelligent. And sometimes we just, we attract just total meatheads who aren't super intelligent. That's, that's a different niche. And sorry if that offends anyone, but yeah, I, I, I laid that out. I, everything was very purposeful. This wasn't like some, like, I, I got lucky in some sense, but everything I did had a meaning. I wasn't just putting out content or doing certain things just willy nilly. All of it had a purpose to kind of create this perception for this niche, get those clients, get them results, and then just create this train rolling that has eventually led to where I am. Yeah. So it is. So I stumbled upon you. Um, you know, my background, I have my bachelor's degree in exercise science. Um, and I'm, you know, very, very in, in, like this is. I'm obsessive with powerlifting, with programming, with nutrition science. And I stumbled upon your, uh, your YouTube channel one day and I was just, just going over the, you know, and I love long form content. And I, and I also realized because my, my, my friend and I uh, talk about business strategies all the time um, with how important long form from content was. And I, I really, really enjoyed watching your, your whole take on, you know, how do you, when is volume more important to a lifter's development over intensity? Um, or, you know, how do we manipulate volume? How do we manipulate intensity? How is the athlete psychology could come into play? Um, and then to just looking over like how you would, would, would teach a movement too. Um, basically just you put everything online, basically that programming is. If somebody was to just follow along, write notes, they could, you know, have, probably write a decent program if they spent, you know, a solid 24 hours just watching your, your, your channel. But I, I think that it's kind of a backwards thing with, um, with, with, with power, with powerlifting coaching and coaching in general is that kind of in order to attract clients, you need to provide value first. Like you have to show what your system is essentially, and then people will kind of buy into it. And then they'll want to get coached by you because they're like, okay, I like this person. I like how he, how he communicates. He seems like he knows what, what he's going on. And, you know, I'm one of those nerds. And like, I was attracted to uh, PRS and TSA. Like, those are my top two cho choices. I just, I didn't go away with you because you were to have these spots available. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just hats off to you, sir. Like that's. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's a tough thing to, to do because I think that anybody who can become a full, full-time powerlifting coach and be good at it and coach the top level athletes is, I mean, that's a huge feat. Um, because yeah, one, I, isn't that, one thing, that, one thing with that too, like going about what kind of what drawn you, that was all purposeful. Like there's been plenty of people that have done shorter form content. And if anyone follows my Instagram, they know I break the rules and I literally write captions all the way into the comments. Like I don't follow, that's all purposeful. Like, does that appeal to everyone? I've had people reach out like, if you just made like five minute videos, more people watch it. I don't care if more people watch it. I want the right people watching it. The 2,300 something people that subscribe to me on YouTube and the 6,600 people on Instagram that follow me are the audience I want. I don't need 100,000 because that doesn't mean all those people are engaged to what I'm trying to do. So like the long form content on YouTube, it wasn't because like I couldn't make a five minute video that was beneficial. It's because I purposely wanted to do something different to target a very specific niche. And it all went with that exact plan I've had from five years ago. I didn't stray from that. I stayed in that plan and continued to target the same niche and following and, and get people like you who, who want that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, you, you attracted Sean Noriega, the number two US APL 83, because mm -hmm. of that. I did yeah. want to ask, um, so you, you, because you said that, that you're, you mainly do, do coach for powerlifters and they're very, very into it. What is it like kind of coaching a guy like Sean, who's so, super aware and lots of these more neurotic powerlifters because um, you know how powerlifters lifters are, I mean, <laughs> self-depreciating lots of the time. Um, but like, especially with a guy like Sean, who's top, who's a top level, like, like when he approached you, was that scary or were you just like, no, I totally know how to do this. I'm excited for the, the, for the this, this is offered opportunity. And like, not only am I excited to work with, with him and, you know, potentially learn a little, a little bit, um, you know, or was it kind of just, just like, holy crap, he's really, he's trusting me. He's number two, in the U S APL. Like now I'm in the line, like I better not mess this up. Like how, how has that been? Yeah. So I'm going to kind of work backwards because there's a couple of questions there answering the question, the latest question there, kind of like, what's it like working with Sean Noriega um, or, or kind of that should say that, how was I nervous? Um, kind of, I don't want to say no. Like, I mean, anytime I, it's not even just Sean, anytime I get a very strong lifter, there's a little bit of nerves with that because there, there's a little bit more responsibility there, especially if they're more in the limelight. Um, if you would have, if Sean would have approached me two years ago, I definitely would have had those thoughts of like, can I even help him? But in the sense of kind of where I'm at now, and I just, I, I don't want to call it arrogance. It's just confidence. I, I, have a, I have a very strong belief in what I do. And I, I have a very strong grasp on what I do. I was very confident I could help him. Um, I, I don't think I, I had any worry about that. Um, and in coaching him, I mean, honestly, it's changed my view of what work ethic is because that dude is a freaking robot. And if you want to ask, is it hard to coach Sean? No, it's literally pretty darn easy. Now, does, is there some like you, you called him a neurotic lifter? I think he's openly will say he's neurotic. There is parts of that. That's a little like the psychology of it and kind of reeling him in sometimes. Yeah, that happens. But for the most, I mean, that's anyone. That's not just Sean. That's everyone in powerlifting can be neurotic at times. But for the most part, it's unbelievably easy to coach him. The dude sleeps, he eats and he trains and he's able because he's an extremely, extremely intelligent person can give me amazing feedback to where we know exactly what we need to do. Like it, a lot of, that's one of the toughest parts with coaching is some people just can't provide very good feedback. So it's on me as a coach to just like over time, figure this out. And it might take a while with Sean. I mean, it, it's, it, yeah. I mean, we can make immediate adjustments because between our two minds and be able to get feedback of exactly how he feels. And because he's been doing that, he's very experienced, even though he's young, he's been doing this for a while. Um, yeah. It's, it's honestly pretty easy. It's not hard. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah, so, so that's something that's, um, you know, it's been really cool seeing how, um, you, you have changed it is, is a power losing programming and, and all that, that, that stuff, you know, changing him from a three days per week squat, like you did last one now doing two times per week squat and, you know, incorporating a little bit more accessory work, you know, just to, to push his squat, which I guess kind of goes into the uh, next question I wanted to just kind of just talk about the main thing with this, with this podcast is really nerding out over the power lifting programming. And something that I think is the most important thing is just how the individualization process looks for, for you. So let, let's say, uh, you know, Steve gets a new client. Let's say I am applying, right? And you see my intake form, answer all of your questions. What does that look like for you? How do you go, go about determining what should I do for this lifter based off of their intake forms? Is it mainly a like a bottom up, like a, a emerging, emerging strategies type of, of approach or top down traditional periodization type of, of planning? Like, how does it look? I don't know. I don't know that that's a very, very broad question. Um, if you need to direct it in any particular spot, I, I can. But I, I've got some notes kind of based on some of the questions you sent me so I can kind of guide it through like the step by step there. But yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. Like it's, it's very, there's, there's a lot of things that go into the thought process. You've got a new athlete or you've got a current athlete because maybe you need to kind of reframe things because things aren't working of kind of what needs to go into it um, and, and all the variables. And obviously, when you get a new athlete a lot, if, especially if they have good past training data, data like Sean, um, we didn't change a ton. We're just making small little manipulations. And I don't know if you knew this his best training ever was when he used to squat twice a week. That's the reason we went back to it. 
um, that's not like something like is new. Like he actually is, is, has gone back and forth. There's, and so some people have really good past training data where you're taking a lot of what they've already done and just making very small adjustments based off of some feedback and things you see within their training to kind of manage fatigue, um, and, and things within that a little bit better. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people don't have good feedback or they don't have really good past training data. Maybe they, they coach themselves and they don't really know what they're doing. Maybe they came from a coach that really wasn't paying much attention. So within that, there's obviously a lot of different variables that go into it. And I mean, um, I mean, one of them that everyone's going to talk about is volume. Um, and there could be a lot of reasons why volume should be individualized. And some of those, I don't think we even know the complete why of, but the, one of the biggest whys of individualization in of volume that I kind of play into, and I've talked about a lot recently in some posts, and I actually plan to do a YouTube about this, YouTube video about this soon, um, is distance traveled. Um, we, we talk about volume, sets, times, reps, times, weight, and that's okay to talk about. Like when I equate volume, I tend to just to think in total sets. That's kind of how I say, okay, this is the volume. This is the workload someone does. They do nine total sets on squats. But within that, there's the reason they landed on nine total sets is a lot of times because of factoring in distance traveled of why they can only do nine sets and someone else does 17 sets or Sean Noriega does 30 plus sets and benches three or six days a week distance travel his, his his the bar moves two inches maybe where a, a super long arm lifter is blowing through two feet range of motion or something like that so distance traveled is one of the biggest variables in, in the sense of volume that's going to individualize what someone's going to do um and that's also going to individualize the, the the percentages too um someone i mean there was there was a study i think it was done by zordos and his lab where they had everyone rep out like 80 percent is either 80 percent or 75 yeah. percent and the and on squat and see how many reps they could do and it varied from eight to 26 reps and the biggest correlating factor was two things femur length and body weight which body weight probably correlates to height as well and it just that's i mean if you have a bigger body weight and taller height you're probably gonna have a longer femur even if it, proportionately it's shorter to your body if you're six foot versus five foot it, it's you're yeah um so that it's, it's going to make a big difference on your leverages, which is then going to play in that total volume. So that's one thing I take into account is like looking at this lifter. Okay. They're six foot three. I'm probably not going to start them out at 18 sets of squats. Like if their past coach did that and they're coming to me and things are wrong, probably off the bat. I'm like, okay, you're probably doing too many sets of squats. Um, just for the fact that, that like you are six foot three, the distance travel and total work load from that is insane you're telling me that you're constantly hurt and you have knee pain um you're telling me that squats aren't a good hypertrophy builder for you okay that all makes sense you fit into this general realm of, of like why because you're six foot three so um again there's more to it than that but i i chose that as kind of like something we can talk about because that's probably something a lot of people don't talk about is well, the distance actually, travel aspect. that's actually really interesting because you're the you're really the only other coach who i've i've heard uh, talk about that because that's something that I always do with my own lifters just because with my own experience I'm not a very efficient power load lifter I'm I'm more of like that brute strength I have very very long femurs like I only do seven sets of squat per week um I on my sumo deadlift although you know that is my my best lift if you watch me when you lift it's kind of like a Charlie uh Dixon where it's just like it, it, it's it still is a long range of motion like I don't go above like five sets of sumo deadlift per week, like hard. Um, and then with bench press, it's just like 13 is like at, at most. If I go above that, I just start getting like hurt. And it's just be, it's just be because like, and, and how do I know that? Because I've played with fire and I've played, you know, and I've gotten like yeah. you know, the, the tendinosis and stuff like that. So I think that's a very, very interesting thing. Um, but because yeah, like that, not one study of in mass, I totally relate, relate to that. I'm one of those, those people who is on the lower end. <laughs> and then, you know, I know, I know like some of my, my buddies, like uh, my friend Kevin, he has these short fingers. You can just go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. It's just like, mm, give me more, please. So yeah, uh, I, I really, really lo like that. So um, I guess uh, a little bit of an intensity, I guess, next. Yeah. Um, so intensity that's one, honestly, I'm, I'm still not sure the exact mechanism of why there's individual characteristics for intensity. That's something that's still kind of like where, where volume, I can kind of see distance traveled and these body lengths and leverages being the reason why, um, and or even lift changes like sumo versus conventional is naturally going to be a changing range of motion, which is probably going to dictate why some people can do more volume on sumo. Intensity, I'm just, I'm not sure the mechanism but something I've really seen in kind of, I mean, there's definitely people who tend to get really beat down from intensity and higher RPEs or just higher loads in general. 
And there's some people who seem to be able to soak that up, yet they're extremely volume sensitive. And it's just the spectrum. Um, and one thing I've probably seen with intensity and where I can kind of start to kind of individualize that is some people tend to adapt quicker to a new stimulus. Um, some people, you can give them a new training block, they can hop right into it. And within a week or so, you can start ramping up intensity and they're able to do it and soak that up and they progress with it. Some people, it might take two or three weeks of submaximal work before they're kind of adapted to this new training before you can overload. If you've heard of kind of like, make sure that you adapt before you overload. And that kind of goes back to the repeat about effect. And I, I don't know if there's a name, there's not really a name for this theory outside of the repeat about effect, but like, what's, what's the, what's the time that someone adapts with that repeat about effect. And that kind of then dictates the, what I find is the individualized individualization of intensity. We're obviously going to have to work up to heavy weights, but is that going to have to be a long drawn out process because it takes longer for them to adapt before we can overload? Or is this someone that within like a week, all of a sudden they can start handling seven to eight RPEs because they adapt super quick. The repeat about effect only happens after like two sessions and they're good to go. So that's kind of, I, like I said, I don't know the mechanism behind that. I, I assume that's going to, has to be probably more neurological because I haven't seen some type of correlation like with the distance traveled or anything like that. It just seems to be something each person's a little bit different on. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how, I mean, there's other, there's other aspects of intensity too, but that's, I think that's one of the big things I've seen. And that then determines block length. Some people might have to do a longer training block because they have to have a longer buildup. Some people are going to do shorter training blocks and, and, and whatnot. So, yeah. So would you say that, um, so with, 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 in terms of ramping up in, in intensity, um, for like an, an intro week, uh, a week one, uh, let's say you have a very, very intensity sensitive lifter. Um, would you start them out like a five RPE in that week one? Yeah, it could be. I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe even four, four to five. I mean, it could be four to five because they have to go well, really how do you light. I mean, them to, to know a four to five. They RPE. don't, there's no possible way. You got to give them a range. Okay. Coaching RPE. Don't just give RPE alone. I mean, unless maybe a seven to eight, someone's good at it. Some people are not, but I mean, I would say the 90% plus of people I program RPE for there's a range. And especially if I'm programming like a four or five, I'm definitely giving a range because no one truly knows there, 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 I, I, I more say, okay, the middle of the range is probably what you should do. But if you're feeling really good, maybe go above that a little bit. If you're not feeling very good, go about below that a little bit. So there, there's probably a percentage based aspect in there prescribing ranges for that RPE. Cool. Yeah, so I, I I do think that is um I'm, I I never thought about it in that context in terms in terms of ramping up intensity and how that contributes to block length because some people just need more time to have that momentum where you know that that fatigue outpaces the, the fitness mm -hmm. I mean, where, where that fitness outpaces the, the the fatigue because I do know that you know kind of like what what you said probably you know probably because of the repeat beat about it, that sometimes you give somebody a new training block new, new training stimulus new training uh you know splits and they just get really sore they have some new exercises and then takes them like like a week to like actually like feel good or even even two and then some lifters it's, it's just like like especially like i've done this with, with women you just give them something and they're just like okay now i'm fine like well, now let's go and start lifting heavier so in, in terms of where you mostly do is i i've seen your, your programming with how you do cap how you do is like for example in your free 15 week intermediate program mm -hmm. you build up those intensities and it looked like in the first one which is more of a foundational developmental block basically from my perspective it was to see what works for this lecture obviously this is a template but I'm assuming in your overall strategy, you're going to start a little bit more conservative if you have a, if you have a new lifter with RPEs and with probably a little bit more self-limiting variations. Is that just to get them to, I guess, like get real in? Is it to help them just get more used to your whole training methods if they're not used to it? Um, what is the biggest reason for that? Is that, or is that like more just like, and it doesn't have anything to do with that. It's just teach them to know like when to hold back. And then like later on when you have to, then you go for it, like a higher intensity, because I know that because what I do personally in volume blocks is I usually cap a lot of my compound lifts at like a 7.5 to an eight on squat, squat bench and deadlift. Whereas with intensity, I might even go up to a 9.5 and like for in like a meat prep. However, in volume blocks, I'll push accessories harder. In intensity blocks, I will not push accessories as hard. So, like maybe like in a volume block, 
we're having a little bit more into that and those intensity kind of being used for that because you know more of the hypertrophy data does say we need to move to a little more of a higher rpe to have that effective reps with a higher load and then also just helps us get create more hypertrophy because in my in my model you know more muscle equals more strength as long as you can teach it later and then later on in a more of intensity of a focus phase i'll push those compound lifts harder probably have a little bit more specificity um in terms of the, the variations and then pull back in that intensity on the accessories um i know that i know i kind of ranch a little, little, little bit there but um no, all makes sense and so kind of answering a couple of questions so like when you said kind of like a new lifter like am i going to have a block like that and very well could I mean, if I'm going to have a new lifter, I'm probably going to start on the conservative event. And uh, I know we're going to kind of talk about bottoms up versus top down programming. Um, when I first get someone new, like I'm not going to I'm not going to periodize their training yet. I don't know it works. I, I, you can't periodize a structure that you don't even know if it's good yet. So a lot of it is like, let's figure out this structure of like this microcycle and this mesocycle structure of this weekly and block structure before we even start periodizing it. So um, in, in some manner, I'm just trying to figure that out. And within the exercise selection, if you're using like self-limiting variations, it could be because it's self-limiting. And that's going to be a little bit more uh, on the conservative side to make sure if, if maybe I'm, if I'm over exaggerating the intensity and the volume, we're still probably able to handle it because it's self-limiting. But that might also be to correct movement errors. Um, maybe there's things that that's going to be able to help to kind of correct. Um, it's going to be able to help make it a little, probably a little bit easier to kind of help manage fatigue and workload because those self-limiting variations are going to be a little less fatiguing, even if we're going to higher RPEs because the absolute loads back down. Um, and then sometimes it just might be just a general inkling of like, I think this is going to transfer well to your training, but like in the sense of like that, that 15 week program, like people are hopping in to this new training that may be different than what they're doing. I wanted some type of introductory period, and that was going to be kind of a safe way to ramp them into the next 10 weeks where we get more specific. Um, so that in some way their body's starting to adapt to this kind of setup, this volume load and the structure so that then we start to increase specificity as we kind of ramp into either one, that third block or two, if they choose that kind of tapering or that kind of peaking and tapering, uh, into a meat, uh, option. So, um, yes, I don't know. I forget some other questions. I'm losing my track there of where I was going, but uh, basically with whole blocks structure. And uh, I was, I was talking about, um, uh, I guess how my, my, my whole approach is a little bit similar in that I, I don't use, if I'm in a volume block, I don't push I mean the compound lifts as, as hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, those for, for a couple of reasons, um, you know, mainly I viewed those as skill practice. Um, I, you know, I still want to, you know, obviously prove strength and because we can obviously still improve strength within plenty of, of RPE ranges, you know, maybe I'm going from a five to an eight. That's how the, the structure looks across like a four week training. Let's say that's what, what it is. But then on accessories, um, you know, I push those hard with, with relative intensity. Um, and, you know, I tell them, you know, with whole psychological arousal and intent when I'm explaining the program to my client, I say, look, I want you to look at this block as volume. So we're going, I want you to really focus a lot of your intent on the, um, on the accessory hypertrophy bodybuilding based exercises like your dumbbell bench press i want you to push those harder on bench press i want you i want to still feel kind of kind of challenging but you know we're mainly just doing this so that we you know can still make some adaptations but we're still trying to we're mostly trying to build muscle because for you as a level lifter, you need to build more, more muscle um, whereas in an intensity block i'll kind of flip the, the script and use a little bit more specific variations for as opposed to in a hypertrophy. And maybe I'm choosing just a really good exercise with like a good seamless fatigue ratio for that muscle group. And then intensity block, it's like I'm thinking about okay, what movements are going to help complement this, this the, the actual lift that we're trying to improve more. So we get a little more specific with, with that. And then I push the intensity harder and I have their psychological switch kind of go from I really need you to focus on this work on, on the squat bench and deadlift and all these variations too. This is the goal of this block. This is the main goal. Uh, I'm not, and I, I, I always make it clear that, you know, you obviously want to take everything seriously, but I think having some sort of a structure of like, this is like the goal of this block. This is why I'm giving you a pause squat. This is why I'm giving you X, Y, Z is really important with athlete buy-in.
Yeah, and for sure. And yet having a very str- a good goal, um, I would say within that, the, the dependence of like the, the the adjustment between accessory and comp list and kind of how I'm going to complement those, it's going to depend on the lifter too. Because there, definitely there's going to be some times where I'm going to have a lifter, um, especially if they're younger, we're going to have some blocks that are more like a power building type setup or even bodybuilding. Like the, the, the squat bench and deadlift for a lot of people is not the most efficient way to build muscle. Now, with some there are, and that usually goes back to, to genetic leverages and people being predisposed to being very efficient at certain lifts. Um, but like for the squat, not everyone is built to squat and build a lot of muscle from it. So we're going to be able to kind of periodize that based off of it. But at the same time, there might be lifters that I'm going to be doing these self-limiting variations of these blocks that are a little less specific with, but maybe they've been lifting for 15 years. They, they, they're, they're pretty close to maximizing their potential. I might not be caring as much about like periodizing the accessories as much as well as I'm about like, okay, we need to back off a bit. And a pause squat's a way for us to be able to push higher relative intensities, but not just beat you up as much. Like let's have these periods where we can train hard, but train hard in a way that's going to be a little bit more self-sustainable long-term um, and be able to, within that too, be able to experiment a bit with setup and, and things like that. That's going to be a little less risky. Like if we're going full specificity and trying to experiment too much and we're trying to do higher volumes or we're trying to do higher, like little things like that. Um, there's a little bit more risk involved and there's a way to like, I, I, there's a lot of times during those blocks on an experiment that I'm going to go in those kind of self learning variations, because it's going to be a real, the way to test it. That's going to be a little bit risky and more conservative, um, uh, so that I can be able to kind of gather that information and then apply that to future blocks where we're going to be more specific. Okay. That, that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, so you did mention earlier that you don't periodize any, anything, you get a new lifter because you don't know what works yet. Mm-hmm. How do you know what works? What are you looking for? I, I mean, I'm looking for a block structure where we are having a primary day on squat, bench, and deadlift within that. What, whether they're squatting or benching or deadlifting twice a week, three times a week, four times a week. That obviously, I'm not deadlifting four times a week, but within that, whatever the frequency is, there's some primary day on squat, bench, and deadlift. I want that in a weekly manner to be the day they feel the best and the strongest. And then not only in the weekly manner, do I want that to be the day they feel the best and the strongest, but at some point within a training block and within the structure, I want there to be like a week four on a Monday that that's the day they not only feel the strongest on the week, but the strongest in the entire block so that we can have some ability to see this to where we're going to peak their strength on some certain day, each block um, on in, in each week. And then after that, most likely what we're going to see is if we continue past that, they're either going to display a plateau in strength, which means the stimulus has kind of run its course. We're not able to, we're not overloading anymore. They've adapted, they've overloaded. Now they're just kind of at this baseline, or we're going to start to see some regression. And usually what you'll see is like, let's say like a week four, they, they peak their strength and they're really strong on all three primary days. Um, if we go into a week five, we're usually going to start seeing fatigue catch up. They kind of plateau. And then tied, like towards the end of a week five into a week six, we'd actually start to see regression where fatigue very much passes the fitness element. And we, we, we we're past the point of needing a deload. Um, and so that's really what I'm looking for is where, when, how can we get all three lifts to line up? And that, that's different. Obviously, maybe we do a block and like, boom, we've got squat figured out. Bench was OK. Deadlift wasn't good. It's just continuing to experiment within the structure until we kind of have some type of predictability and consistency with all three lists where we know that they're getting stronger on a weekly basis to peak at a certain point. Um, and they're strong on a certain day where we're managing fatigue accordingly to make sure that it's it, in a weekly structure, it's, it's optimized. And then once we have that kind of, for the most part, figured out, then we can start periodizing that within some type of, of plan of, of rep schemes and, and looking at how we're going to kind of go into a meet and whatnot and, and experimenting within that structure. Okay. I really, really, I really like that. So, um, let's say if you got a, a lifter though, who they're like, Hey, see, I'm, I'm eight weeks out from a meet. This is what I've done in the past. And you don't have the opportunity necessarily to have a lot of those developmental blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, would you mainly rely on their, on like their background feedback? Cause I mean, you know, assuming they're going into a meet, they probably have some, some training experience. Uh, would you basically go off of that and what they and always say what has worked for them? How much do you deviate from that? Yeah, I mean, it would just be your best guess. Like, I mean, just like the first block, even though, like, let's say they don't have a meet, that first block is my best guess. But I don't have a timeline of when I need to, like, like we, we can start experimenting with that. We can change things. 
if they're eight weeks out from a meet, that best guess is going to be what we're going to do for the next six weeks. Like we don't have time, like maybe there could be some minor adjustments. We, we don't have time to make any large scale changes or else we're going to, we're going to throw things off and the day to day accumulation is going to be way off to know what worked and what didn't work. So I'm going to take that best, best guess based off of their prior training, the feedback they gave me. Um, and yeah, we're gonna have to hop right into it of that best estimate. So, I mean, literally, I mean, like if you put out a free program, like I did, that's my best estimate of what most people are going to probably kind of, uh, that's going to work for them. And so that's kind of what's going to happen when someone comes to you is, okay, I have this general framework. I've coached people probably typically like you. I mean, most coaches start to tend to get people generally in the same type of, I don't want to say niche in the sense of what we talked about earlier, of like the, their, their demographics, but also like body weight and USAPL and all that kind of stuff. Like it's a 93 kilo lifter in the USAPL. Um, coaches tend to start attracting more and more people like that. And when you've got a lot of people in that weight class, um, you start to get an idea of where their starting point should be. Um, and while it's very good to be able to coach a wide diversity of people, uh, I think that's one thing a lot of people will look for is like, does this coach, does this coach coach people like me? And there is definitely a lot of credence and, 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 uh, weight on that because they get some information because these people are generally going to be like you. They're going to generally be around the same height, the same weight, the same general body makeup. Um, and it's going to give a lot of good ideas of, okay, like these people are mainly going to be around the same typical style of programming. And they're going to slightly deviate from that based off of individual differences. I really, really, really like that, the point on um, that training people who are in similar weight classes their, their training is probably going to look somewhat so similar, you know, there might be, you know, and then obviously some smaller individual re response, but, you know, a 74 versus a 105, like uh, that's going to be a different, you know, specificity, the, the different volume, because, you know, we're going to different, we're dealing with different absolute strength levels and among all, all the other things with, you know, like you said, body composition. So I really uh, do, do like that. Um, I guess going into how would you um with with correcting your form as an online powerlifting coach, because this is something that I have found to be very difficult as somebody when I first started coaching. I was like, uh, it was like I, I did it in person, like most trainers do, and I knew that if I was with somebody for five ten minutes and we were just working through their squat, I could get it fixed. And then with with, with online, it became it became a lot harder. Because I wasn't able to like stand there, wasn't able to like just look at them and then adjust in real time. So I guess how does that process of say you have somebody who has a rather uh, they have they're struggling hitting depth on squats, um they are on they are they are confused about why they can't um, hit it. How would you adjust their technique? Just for example, on that, and you, you can use whatever else you you want to to but just yeah. for the, of an example. So you touched on one thing that's vital. I don't know how anyone coaches online that hasn't coached in person. That is unbelievable. And even if it doesn't perfectly translate over, um, I, I mean, I, I've, I still train it. I train two people in person still. I've trained for one, one power lifts and the other one I've, I've trained for a long time. But I, I, mean, I started out as a personal trainer. I've, I've legitimately probably trained thousands of people and taught them how to squat. I've seen so many different, uh, uh, not feedbacks, but their responses to how I cue them and how different people react to it and different personality types um, and, and seeing how someone who's a little bit more timid versus kinesthetically aware and all, all these different things. I've learned a lot from that, but getting into the online element is obviously different. Um, and I would say one of the biggest things is having a framework and foundation for how you coach movement. And what I mean by that is like, it doesn't mean everyone squats the same, everyone benches the same and everyone did, did lifts the same. But within those three movements, there's foundational aspects for what you're looking for in every lifter. Now there's gonna be variations based off of that, based off of stance width, based off of their height, um, bar position, um, their ability to, so many different variables within that, but you have foundational, foundational principles of what makes up the squat bench and the deadlift. Like the squat is going to have knee flexion and hip flexion. Um, some coaches like to say it just basically has the hip flexion and the knees should just drive out and they stay over the ah, heel. That's a different foundational path. That's a different down foundational framework for how you coach squat. It is. Um, so I, I think having that foundation and being able to understand why the squat is, is basically functioning as it is, then allows you to start to develop cueing that and different individual characteristics that base off of that. So, um, and then within queuing too, 
some people are very kinesthetically aware or aware of their body. They, you can be able to tell them what to do and they can be able to immediately do it. Some people are absolutely horrible at that. And so that's kind of learning. It's kind of learning how to be able to kind of give internal cues versus external cues versus directional cues versus feel cues. Everyone's a little bit different on kind of the, how they perceive movement. Um, so I'm very big on feel. Sorry, just, just, just for the, the, the listeners, would you uh, mind giving an example of internal, external uh, feel? Those, those so like cues? Uh, a f- internal versus external kind of goes with feel and directional because mm-hmm. feels more internal, directional is more external. Um, directional, like I'm just gonna use the, the, I don't like this one, but sit back. Like it tells you what to do. You're, you're, you're having a motion going back versus feel would be more feel your midfoot and maintain that. Um, I, those are just two random ones that are coming up, but like, um, feeling what uh, kind of getting idea. Like I'm a very, I, me as a, I'm very kinesthetically aware, but I'm also a very much a feel person. If you give me directional cues, I don't do as well with it, but if I feel what to do, I can immediately replicate that. And so within that, people who are a bit more external and directional, they are a bit more cue oriented, like drive the knees forward or or let the chest lean, things like that in the squat. People who are more feel tend to do better with doing something that gets them into position to feel that movement. So let's say you're having someone who's who's having issues on squat where they're they're flaring the rib cage and extending anteriorly rotating put them under a safety bar and all of a sudden, boom, their rib cage stays in place and their pelvic stays in place because the, the, the weight bias of a safety bar kind of manages that position better. And you say, that's how you should feel when now you low bar squat. Um, that's where, not saying that you couldn't cue that person as well, but they may do really well with using some type of variation that kind of puts them into certain positions that then you say, let's translate that onto a low bar squat where someone who's a bit more external and directional, you're going to need to take the movement and then, uh, have to cue them within it because they're not going to be able to translate the feel aspect, if that makes sense. And then with that too, like I said, some people are very kinesthetically aware. You can give them a bunch of cues, boom, they can do it. Some people are absolutely chronic overthinkers. If they have more than one thing to think about, everything goes to crap. And so one, you have to be very careful and you have to give them a cue and let them continue to develop that and work on it. But two, that might just be the lifter that just kind of needs to do the movement. Like, um, I have some lifters that like, if I was to give them too many variations of a lift, they start to leak into each other and then they don't get good at any of them. They might just have the competition squat war because they literally just need to practice the movement. I, I could give them cue after cue after feel after variation or whatever it may be internal, external. They don't get it unless they just continually do it. So there's just, there's so many ways to be able to do that. And a lot of it goes back to just how people kind of their lifter psychology. And that goes to programming as well. I think lifter psychology honestly, maybe the single biggest individualizing factor in programming. And it also comes back to movement as well. So, so, so let's talk a, a little bit about that then uh, with, with the program, with the powerlifting uh, psychology, because I think that's something that is never, ever, ever really talked about. I think people are, are like, bro, I just want the magical three by five, but like make it like super individualized before me without realizing that a lot of coaching is working with a human being with thoughts with feelings with emotions with expectations so how do you manage that how does that play into your programming yeah i mean i have a video on youtube about that and it's i think it's my least watch one which is i I, I posted about it multiple times i'm like this is so freaking important like this should be the most watched one stop watching my volume and intensity one because you all get that you need to understand the lifter psychology stuff because like um, I have little notes here of how you break it down. Like one type of lifter is the one that goes off adrenaline and intensity. And some people might say, oh, we need to suppress that. Eh, you could, but if that's a strength of theirs, why not program to be able to leverage that strength? There's someone who's going to do really well with a top set and then backing off from that a good deal. They're not going to do good with a straight set. If you give them straight sets, that person's going to suck it up. Or if you give them a top set, um, let's even say that some people are so adrenal intensity based. If you give them a top single and then a top rep set, that top rep set is going to be absolute crap. They, they drill and dump on that single. And then they're going to be terrible at the rep work. That's someone that I might not do singles very often with because that single is just a skill practice and kind of like a testing parameter and not necessarily the, the main stimulus we're looking for until we get closer to like a meet. Um, if that's going to constantly screw up their rep work, I'm going to do more rep top sets with them because I want the main stimulus to be something that they actually care about. So um, so yeah, uh, the other one could be lifter confidence. People who are very timid about that top set, they see that top set, they overthink it, they, they, it just gets in their head, um, they get very timid. 
Um, a, a simple thing for that is maybe they need ramping sets. They need to ramp up with multiple sets. And I, I mean, I have some lifters that they will do their top rep set and I'll say, okay, well, you just was, you were just able to do 300 pounds for four reps. And if I were to give you that 325 single first, you would be super scared of that. But the fact that you did 350 or 300 for four, and now you get to do a single at 325. Well, of course I can do 325. I just did 300 for four. It builds confidence of ramping up to it. So there's other, there's other ways to be able to do that too. But just an example of lifter confidence is, is ramping sets seem to work really well. Um, and another one is lifter focus. Um, and that kind of goes a couple things is some people, um, like the single taking away from top sets, people tend to focus on one thing. Um, I'm trying to leave my notes here. Oh, so lifter focus, like what I mean more by that is let's say someone tends to always look forward towards the end of the block. Like they say, you have a, you have a, a training block right yeah, now. I know you're They're looking about. at week four. That's all they care about is week four or five. They're not caring about week one or week two. And they're just kind of going through the motions. Um, I have people like that. I literally then will write up the training block, but I only send them one week at a time. I, they, I, I don't want the same thing. I have one client who is two weeks out and he just wants to, he's so worried about what the taper is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Bro, you, you do your job. <laughs> yep. So, I mean, that might be something where I send one week at a time, even though I have it written up. Um, and that kind of like some people do bottoms up programming. They literally just program one week at a time. I never have done that. But what I am doing is sending one week at a time because I want them just to focus on that. Nothing else. Focus on that one week. And then this kind of goes to some other like lifter motivation things too. Within that too, I, I've done that with someone who they tend to struggle with motivation. And if I create a weekly competition where I tell them, I'm going to give you this week and based off of how you do on each set this week, I'm going to adjust the weights for next week based off of that. And if you do better, I'm going to give you more weight next week. And if you do really good, I'm going to give you even more weight than, weight than I planned. Um, in my head, I pretty much already know what I'm going to do, but to them, they think they're determining the program that increases motivation on the weekly session, not only increases the focus, but increases the motivation that, okay, this week one matters because if I do this really, really well, Steve's going to give me more weight next week. And if I do that one really, really well, he's going to give me even more weight. And then they have a feel and an ownership and control within their programming. So um, I, I could go through tons of different examples of this. I've got, it, it could get long winded, but just examples of it. Like all of these things are little minor tweaks to how you're each lifter you're programming to basically individualize that psychology and what they struggle with or what, not only what they struggle with, maybe what they're really strong with. Like, it, it, like I said, with the adrenaline stuff, like don't look at that as a weakness, look at that as a strength in some manner. No, I, I, absolutely. I, you know, I really love, like, like how, how you're saying, I don't want to suppress their personality. I want to work with it. I want to maximize it the best I possibly can. For myself, for example, I am very, very much intensity focused. I am very driven on that. Um, and I think that a lot of power lifters also, obviously everybody has different per per personality. Well, a lot of really good athletes, they're good at powerlifting because they're really good at doing one rep. They're really, really good at channeling all that energy in for that third attempt and then building it up. But like, I also really like how you said that, you know, sometimes you're going to be, it, it could be really lift dependent too. Like for myself, squat freaks me out. I'm not going to lie. Like I put the weight on my back. I'm like, I have to walk this out. I have to let it settle. Then I have to think about like all these things. It doesn't feel right to me. Like it just never, never has been. I'm not built for it. And I have to go all the way down because I'm like a freaking forever long range of motion. And then I hopefully I hit depth <laughs> and then go back up. And so like with, like with my coach, my, my last meet prep, I, I told him I wanted more heavy work because I just wasn't confident. I was like, I, I would like more singles with this block on my squat in, in particular because I didn't feel confident. I you know but I also really like that other approach of giving them, dude, you just did 300 for, for four, 325. Pff, your E1RM on this day is way above that. Like I got this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when they get into an intensity focus block, they're just like, I see 325. Maybe that was scary, but now it's just like, I can do this with like, if you don't do like 300 for four before so this isn't this isn't a, a big deal so yeah i really like that i know that bryce lewis is really big on that type, on that type of stuff too i had him on my podcast he was he was talking a lot about how like his psychology background kind of play into how he approached programming mm -hmm. 
Yep. Really and I think, cool. and I, I like Bryce's stuff. We do, we definitely take a look. So I'm not sure his psychology focus. I really like consumer and behavioral psychology, like why people do the things they do. Um, and that's not necessarily in the sense of like sports psychology of like performance anxiety and stuff. I know he really likes to get in there. I'm not. And so I would say the behavioral side really helped me on this because I'm trying to think of like how like this person does X, but why do they do it? Um, and that kind of helps to get a really good idea of like why they perform well on top sets, why they don't perform well on top sets, why this very even keeled lifter does better when I just give him straight sets and how they're actually able to keep the RPs pretty similar across six sets because they never got amped up and they never had an adrenaline dump and they just kind of maintain the intensity throughout. And there's just so many things within that of like, of like why people behave the way they do and how you can be able to manipulate things to be able to adjust for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually just put out a YouTube video kind of talking about that with like, should you get hype for, uh, for your, like how hype should you use it? Should you get for your, your top top size? Is it good or bad? I kind of said exactly what, what you said with different lifters are going to express hype differently too. Some of the lifters lift are just going to be very, very like reserved and just be in their own, own head and they won't really be external about it. Like John Hack. Like I mm -hmm. don't, I've never seen John go like, okay, we're, we're going to, we're going to 881 pounds. He just like, okay, I'm going to 881 pounds. Probably thinking about like a meme while he's doing it and then just lifts it. And then you have Isaac Whistler who is just yelling and like a freaking like chimpanzee in the gym um going all going all, all, all crazy and so um we all express things differently and that can really you know say a lot about why are they responding to programming in a, in a particular way i really 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 like that because um the brain you know that's the central that's the central governor physiology one-on-one -on -one, cns spinal cord brain is going to control a lot of our you know a lot of the response to inputs like the outputs and whatnot and how we re respond to like for myself the reason why because like, something i've noticed too with like more of those adrenaline focused lifters is that um if you give them like a top set and like like, like what you like what you said they're like oh I'm, I'm i'm dead and maybe you program then more back more like maybe if you're doing like a percentage back down right uh let's say you have a single at eight and maybe if somebody who is, you know, not as focused on that, they don't get as gas from a single at eight because they just don't have like that same energy going into it. Maybe you don't have to bring them like, um, like a big, as big of a back down for their three by three. Maybe for the guy who got to get some more, more gas and who gets more fatigue from set to, to set, or, you know, that just, they're going to be so fatigued from, from that, you bring a larger percentage back down. So, and then somebody who is just more chill, like, you know, th that could be reason why they respond so well to straight sets because they can just get in more volume accumulation that weekend and get high quality work. Yeah. yeah that's really good stuff. I, I man, this is uh, it's so cool. Um, so I guess uh, just a, a couple more, more questions for you. Um, yeah. So what does being a good coach mean to you? What, and I know that that's a very broad question, but I know that like, 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 I guess like, what's your philosophy with, with coaching? What do you see your role as? And what do you think that anybody who wants to get into coaching, what are the big rocks they should focus on? So I mean, at the base level, a good coach gets their clients results. I mean, especially like in powerlifting, they're coming to us to get stronger. If you get none of your athletes stronger, I don't know if you can call yourself a good coach. It, maybe you are friends with them and they think you're a nice person, but like our goal is to get them stronger. But within that, there's a bit more kind of like softer skills or softer elements of it that are going to be kind of going into it that um, some coaches are going to be better at. And that's why some coaches are better for some lifters versus others, because they, they are able to uh, appeal to them in different manners. Um, like I'm a pretty blunt dude. Like I, 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 I'm not a football coach type blunt, but like, um, I'm not a super big motivation. I gotta, I gotta gas you up. Like, no, you're freaking lift. Like I'm, I'm kind of more of that. And so if someone comes to me and it's like, yeah, I really just need someone like, I really struggle with motivation. Um, I really need someone who's going to be able to talk and listen to me. I was like, I'm just going to be honest. That's not my thing that there's other coaches who are a lot better at the sense of kind of the sympathetic aspect. Um, I, I have a bit different of skills, but even within that, like, I mean, a good coach, a um, little bit of lists here of kind of things I kind of notated down, um, having a positive impact on their life. Um, I mean, I, I definitely have a, a, a different 
philosophy and kind of how I go about coaching. Um, you kind of, I think, mentioned it earlier. I mean, I'm full. Like, I only coach 35 people. That's not everyone. Um, there are coaches that coach a lot more than that. Um, not saying you can't have an impact on someone's life if you're coaching 100, but I think if you're coaching 35 or 25, you can have a bit more of an interpersonal relationship and ability to kind of connect with this person because I have the time for all of them. So I want to make sure I have a positive impact on their life, like not just their coaching, getting results, but like that, that they take something away from this, whether and whatever that may be. Now, I, I coach a lot of people who coach themselves, like for them, positive impact on their life is helping them make them a better coach. Um, for others, I have some college kids who really struggle with time management, helping them with that. Like there, there's different ways you can kind of help with that. So um a good coach is able to adapt as well. Like they don't just have one thing they do. They don't teach the squad a certain way. They don't only program one way. They're able to adapt. And that goes a lot back to that kind of lifter psychology, like being able to take what the lifter's strong suits and weaknesses are and be able to adapt to them. Um, another one, this is unfortunately kind of rare, caring about everyone equally. Um, I think we see online too often, like you, you get your Sean Noriega and that's all you care about. I mean, I literally try to make sure I don't post about Sean too much. Because I, I literally will go through my athlete list and say, who have I posted about recently or who have I put on my story recently? And if I haven't, I make sure to go through the checklist. I don't have like a hard checklist, but I literally try and go through each one of them because I want to make sure every single person I have, whether they are Sean Noriega or they have they competed at a local meet and they just like doing it for themselves, they are going to get equal attention on my page. They're going to get equal attention to my coaching um, in all aspects of it. So um Another thing too, like I mentioned, like I do this because literally this is my choice. Like I didn't, I didn't have to be a powerlifting coach. Like I got to choose what I wanted to do. I mean, I, I think a good coach is, has passion. Like, I, I don't know why there, there's legitimately, I think powerlifting coaches out there that don't really want to be powerlifting coaches. And I'm, I'm not really sure why it's not like we make a ton of money. Um, you should have passion for it. And that kind of goes to the next part is like maintaining some foothold within the sport. Um, I don't compete anymore. Um, some people might look at that as a negative, but within that I'm not done lifting. Like just because I don't personally compete on the platform, I will never stop low bar squatting, benching and deadlifting. I won't stop doing it. And that's where I think there would be an issue is if I ever stopped doing that, I would have to start to have a pretty big disconnect away from being able to relate to the movements, relate to the grind of powerlifting per se, um, and relate like I, I still get coached by Brad Cruyard, even though I don't. I'm not, I don't plan to compete anymore. I've, I did that for a while and it's just not within my goals anymore. I'd rather focus on coaching. Um, I still want to lift to be healthy, but he still coaches me because I still want to be able to have that, that relationship of knowing kind of what my athletes are going through as well. So I can relate to them. Um, I don't think I personally would not see as a negative. If a coach doesn't want to compete anymore, I would see it as negative. If they decide that I'm just not going to lift anymore. And I'm going to do other things Shit, I'm still going to coach powerlifting. Um, I know for me, I don't know how I'd be passionate about it. If I just completely stopped lifting, like that, I, I mean, if I, if I don't, if I, once I stop like liking lifting, how am I going to like being involved in the sport? So um, and then lastly, this kind of goes back to probably some things that just kind of I care about. Um, uh, I was actually on a uh, Brad and Sean Collins. They have a mentorship and they had me, Matt Cronin and Marcellus on to do a roundtable discussion. And one of the last things they, they said is, what's your goal within coaching? Um, and I said, my goal within coaching is simply I want to be the best powerlifting coach in the world. And that's not literal. It's just like saying, I want to be the best husband in the world. Are you literally going to be the best husband in the world? No, that's not something we can actually tangibly calculate. I just want to be the best powerlifting coach in the world in the sense of putting the effort in to build a legacy, whether that's helping other coaches or other lifters. Like, I mean, I, I think someone I strive to be is like a Mike to share in 30 years, people are still going to know who Mike to share is because of his contributions, but still what everyone's being able to, whether you run the emergence, uh, you run the emergence, emerging strategies approach, doesn't matter all of us have taken something from Mike T and that's something even after he's, he's out of this industry, people are going to still talk about him. Um, so yeah, leaving some type of legacy that, that doesn't necessarily mean you are, you have to do that to be a good coach, but I know that's within my goals and what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, th I think those are um, all very, very admirable things. Um, and I, I would, I definitely have to agree with you with, um, you know, always having a passion or being involved in some way, shape or form in the sport. Um, because, you know, you're not always going to want to compete. Like, you know, you, you could be, you know, one of those, you know, masters competitors, but, you know, always being somewhat involved in, in the sport, li lifting weights and, and whatnot. Um, like I, like my, my clients at times are surprising. They're like, yeah, I have a coach. They're like, why, you know, things I'm like, yeah, but like, I know, I know the value of, of a coach, like, and I, I, I want to be able to relate to, to relate to you. So I think those are all, um, really, really good things for the audience to, to, to chew on, you know, especially for people who are thinking about it, because what we said about like, 
you should really love this because you're again you're not making a, a, a ton of money like you, you you can live comfortably but you're not a doctor for sure um so i guess i'll just to wrap the, the, this up um where do you see uh the whole sport of powerlifting going because it's been taking off quite immensely um and i think you know this is one of the reasons why becoming a powerlifting coach quote unquote per se is um becoming more of a legitimate career um yeah where do you see it going so i'll be honest i'm not completely sure um especially this week has been a crazy <laughs> week um we don't even know if the usapl and the ipf are going to be a thing anymore together at least and they're going to separate i'm not sure we were obviously in a sense of growing power lifting we have had some exponential growth over the last five or six years and we're kind of we're slowing down now we're not not growing but we're, we're kind of tapering off of that that initial like rush of growth and we're at a point now where if we don't do something to nurture that growth, we're eventually going to have regression because, I mean, just like I said, I'm not competing anymore. People most likely are not. This is a sport that the majority of people aren't going to do for the next 30 years. Um, it, it's a sport that we're seeing a lot of growth in because college kids do it. They do it for five to seven years. They get married. They have kids. They start to taper off of it. That's probably the, the, the stereotypical life cycle we're going to see of a lot of power lifters. Some are going to stay around for a long time, but that's going to be kind of what we see because um, the, the fact of the matter is, is to be good in the sport, you have to put a lot of time commitment into it while making no money. Um, so I definitely think we have a platform to grow it. Um, I think it's just a matter of like, can everyone get on the same page to do that? And I'm just not sure. Um, I think if at minimum we can stay at kind of where we're at now, that's awesome because it's, it's given a, a possibility to make this a career. It's given the possibility for large scale competition and for people being able to do it. Um, but if I'm going to say where it's going to grow into the future, I'm not sure because it honestly just depends on a lot of factors coming together. And if we can actually kind of unify to be able to kind of grow the sport versus 50 plus federations all fighting each other and USAPL and IPF disassociating and and all these things but um yeah i didn't really answer your question out of saying i'm not sure i just think there's a lot of ifs and because of that i'm trying to grow the sport but i think i try to not think about where where are we going to be in five years and more so what can i do in the short term to build the framework to grow it um of podcasts of youtube channels of trying to disperse information um, i mean one thing that i've really tried to push lately and it's not my idea josh roar did the initial uh, the original prime time i think back in like 2016 at nationals phenomenal idea we're still i mean that that honestly changed the sport in a big way having prime time sessions um i tried to start bringing that to a local level um, last year with the Midwest prime time. And I think we're now seeing a lot of meets copying that literally the current this weekend, whether they want to say so or not, are copying it. I don't know if you saw that, yep. but they're calling it something different, but they're literally now condensing things into two prime time sessions, whether they want to say they were influenced or not. I think that has, I, I could go on for an hour about why I think that has such a huge potential to grow the sport. Um, but little things like that, like let's build this framework that gives the potential to grow so that we can get money because the only way we grow is more money. That's just the fact that matters. But everyone's like, oh, we need more money. Okay, well, that's cool. That's what we want in five to 10 years, but how do we get there? And so little small things like that, if, if, if each person that has influence can have kind of like their one thing that they're able to kind of con uh, contribute to grow it, I think we're gonna get there. But if everyone just fights each other and they don't have any continuity, we're never gonna go anywhere. Sure, yeah, I, I, um, I, I think that, that definitely there's potential to grow it, we are seeing, you know, a recent influx, obviously leveling off a, a little bit, but I'll have to agree with you. You know, if you can get a little bit more on the, on the same page with being powerlifting more like, you know, similar to the NFL uh, in terms of like having like one big governing body um, or whatever, maybe having like one option for like, I don't know, like drug-free, one option for un for untested and stuff like that. Just like making a little more like co cohesive as opposed to like, I, like there's 5,000 different federations. And I, I really do think that, you know, if we can get a little bit more on the same page, then, you know, potentially put some more money into the sport, uh, you know, however that looks like. I mean, I know that Stephanie Cohen, you know, her, her Kratos is supposed to be kind of like that. And, you know, that that's kind of one of her, her big, big things. So I think that, that the, you know, there's at least an awareness that we need to have a change. I think that's good. And, you know, having people like you, using their, their, their platform in the short term to help nurture the sport is the best way to help do that in, in the long term. So I like that mindset. Yeah. And I'll throw one thing out there. 
I, I know I'll say definitively the single best way and biggest way to grow this sport is to somehow get every other state to do what Texas is doing. They get their, they require power, the football teams to power lift in the off season. Dang. That would be sick. And why do you think all the desk lifters are coming from Texas now? They're lifting in sixth grade PE. Then they're required to power lift for the football team. They all are like, they're dominating football, obviously. Most of them aren't going to the NFL. And then guess what? They come back like a Russ or he, and they start power lifting. And then boom, we've got, we've got a sport that's exponentially growing, not only in numbers, but in the achievements and the standards of what we're able to accomplish. I don't know why other states aren't copying Texas because just from the football side, not the power side, the football side, it's obviously working. I mean, like, I yeah. mean, you get bigger, stronger, faster, you're going to get better. And is powerlifting the single best way to be able to like be a football player? I'm not going to say it's the best strength and conditioning element, but like those kids sometimes don't want to lift. But if you give them a competitive platform like powerlifting and say, okay, go compete in powerlifting in the offseason, that's a little bit more like motivating for them. If some way we could get all these other states to adopt the same thought process, and because I don't know if you know this, Texas high school powerlifting is the single biggest powerlifting federation in the entire world. Wow. They have more powerlifters competing in Texas high school powerlifting than any other federation in the world. If we could get that in each state, powerlifting would be mainstream immediately. That would be pretty cool. I don't know how to do it. Outside of like slapping all these people across the face saying, why is Texas getting all these D1 athletes and you're not like, eh, because they're lifting um, and they're making it a big deal. But like, yeah, that would be the single biggest way to grow the sport if we could ever figure out how to do it. I am 100% on board with that. <laughs> I think so, that would be really awesome. So anyways, Steve, I wanted to thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Really appreciate you giving your time um, and just kind of scouting a little bit on your on your knowledge on on powerlifting. Um, I think the listeners definitely took a lot away from it. I, I de- certainly did. Um, I guess where can people find you on tag your social media, whatever whatever plugs you got? Yeah, just search PR's performance on Google, and you'll probably find all my stuff. My website, I've got my websites. I'll call it underrated. I've got like a hundred plus blog posts on there. I don't think people really consume blogs anymore like they used to, even though I like to write. Um, but I've also got a YouTube channel. If you search PR's performance, PR's underscore performance on Instagram. Um, so yeah, if you just type in Steve Denovi or PR's performance on Google, you'll be able to find anything. So we're going to Sean Nori, Noriega and we'll talk about yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or go to his, he's always tagging me. I appreciate that. He's always giving me shout outs. He's awesome. Yeah. It's great. Anyway, Steve, uh, thank you so much for, for, for coming on again and to the listeners for listening and we'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.